I want to talk about sustainability. I realize it's still very early, um, but it's very important, especially here in Asia. As architects, it's become really part of our daily practice. This is a building uh, designed uh, to in-house an ethnography museum, and it has all the main features of sustainability, water, catchment, uh, smart lighting, smart materials, etc. This is the back of that building, the orientation and the folding even allow for nature to, let's say, flow through casually. This building is part of its environment. However, we don't need many new buildings. The world is already pretty much built. So a much better thing would be to recycle, reuse, and upgrade existing buildings. This is a power station in Shanghai. Now it's an art museum, and we're proposing installations and technologies to make it a more natural environment, to make it integrated with this mega city. However, that's still not enough. Imagine that every single building on the planet is completely autarkic and sustainable you still don't have a sustainable city. The problem is that cities kind of lead a life of their own. They follow their own pathway. They are organic. If you look at this particular map, they're almost like monsters. These two mega cities, the nodes, are Beijing and Tianjin, both more than 10 million people. It's almost impossible to define where one starts and the next stops and vice versa. They have bled into the countryside, this kind of gray zone in the middle, become completely diffused environment. Within that context, we now try to design eco-cities. I want to argue that Asia demands a radically new model, a new thinking of what these eco-cities are. Even urban planning itself has to be redefined within the context of Asia. If it's so diffuse, the simple conclusion I will put forward is that we should not build any new city. No new cities. Not even new eco-cities. It's just a drop in the ocean. That's pretty radical. If you look at the map of China, maybe I can convince you. At the moment, we always understand cities as these sort of insular dots with a name and a place. In reality, the people live in between these dots. This is a density curve. All the people in this gray area kind of living an urbanized lifestyle. You could argue this is the world's largest megalopolis with over 400 million people. And it's gone largely unnoticed. If we zoom in on that zone, that green blob with the GIS map, you see an area the size of France that is almost invisible because it's so granular. On the right side, if you zoom in even further, you see it consists of an infinite number of tiny villages. These villages together accommodate one massive urban field. This is not unique in China. We see the same in India and in Indonesia. So we really have a new, a radically new setting, a new context in which to design eco-cities. Diffusion has become a major challenge. There's many of these weird hybrids now forming, if it's rural and industrial, or if it's natural landscape and urban, or if it's the city and agriculture. Completely indefinable, hard to distinguish hybrids. That's the natural landscape and our hinterland. But the cities themselves still follow a sort of predictable logic. There is still a universal um, trend that can be distilled. If we look at the urban cores in, in China, for instance, this is Beijing, and how it has grown, simply expanding sideways. The pink is 2000, and the yellow is the year 2010. So in 10 years, the city almost doubles, doubled itself and its urban footprint simply growing sideways. Beijing is a monocentric city, but a beautiful example of a polycentric city is Shanghai, where I live, the Yangtze River Delta. Shanghai, in the same 10 years, pink and yellow, has doubled itself and its urban footprint. 
So what you have to conclude is that there is this natural tendencies for cities to move outward linearly. This is the Yangtze, uh, this is the Pearl River Delta, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Hong Kong. Here, there was no room to move outward. So the yellow has been kind of squirted in little corners in nooks and crannies. In that environment, the city has almost reached its limits. And it's in this context that we have landed our first job, trying to implement these new ideas of not building new eco-cities. To be precise, in Pingdi, next to Longang. Pingdi is a tiny little industrial settlement, and it wants to become an eco-city. But there's no room. If we cut out all the mountains on this map, there's no more room to build. The city has taken up all the space. So what we suggested was to kind of de-urbanize, where normally cities eat their way slowly up the mountain, consuming more and more green space, we suggested let's reverse the process of urbanization. Let's pull in the green space deep into this industrial settlement, creating these kind of green corridors. These green corridors become the backbone of your new eco-city. So you don't have to destroy the city and build again, as is now the case in China. You can do it gradually, keep the people in place, and slowly upgrade your environment. These green corridors also accommodate all your future infrastructure. Because when we're talking about sustainability, much of the technology is going to come available very soon, but isn't here yet today. It's evolving so quickly, we have to actually accommodate for future developments to be incorporated in this new city. One example is green energy. The second major challenge we face when we're doing eco-cities in China is that when you build a perfect eco-city in a computer and then you plug it into the state grid, the energy is coal-fired, 70%. That energy is black energy. It's not sustainable. It's not zero carbon, even though your computer model says, I made the perfect eco-city. So we started looking at these maps where you can actually harvest at an industrial scale these renewable energies. And in China, there's a lot of potential. The challenge is to bring it to where the people are consuming that energy. But also here in Asia, we're building a vast, what's called ultra high voltage network. You're actually able to transport the energy from where they're currently digging up coal to where the people are living and consuming energy. So what we proposed was to simply convert all the coal-rich areas to areas of renewable harvesting. This would allow for China to become completely renewable even by 2011, but consumption goes up, so by 2030 we're missing a bit. I'm really annoyed by this shortage, so we started looking at making these cities more efficient, actually keeping the footprint smaller to reduce their consumption. The third major challenge came when we started doing this proposal in Tianjin, the mega city I showed in the beginning. We were asked to do a green CBD on this beautiful little land tongue in the heart of the city. But looking at the satellite image, it be, it's become immediately clear that the environment is radically polluted. So even if we would do our perfect green proposal, follow all the ideas and logics that we have developed and built our little green hub here, it really wouldn't impact its larger context. Actually, pollutants will seep back in. In this particular case, what we did, we siphoned off the river. So part of the river is clean and then the regular flow is still dirty. That's a kind of bizarre solution. What we learned was that in China, the core definition of an eco-city has to be changed, not just zero carbon or low carbon, but it actually has to remediate its environment. And that's important because if we look at the water bodies across the Asian subcontinent, it's like a capillary system. These pollutants travel through these rivers in a fine network. You can't hide from pollution. The cities in this landmass all have to become networked, working together to remediate their context, to remediate the brownfield that is China. As I mentioned, much of it is already built. The fourth major challenge we face 
with eco-cities is that they have to become somehow adapted to a more livable lifestyle. If we look at this simple diagram, it shows that all the infrastructure in place is so coarse, it's so vast, that walking around is almost impossible. We suggest to kind of refine the existing road grids, first by adding a public transit network, and then by adding another grid that is for slow traffic, walking and biking. These two grids together really shrink the distances in your urban environment. And they also create this kind of exciting green corridor of little local parks, green pockets across the city. So what we're giving these existing, still non-sustainable cities is a bit of time. By starting in the industrial sub-centers around these cities and upgrading these first with these green networks, we can slowly work our way back to the old centers you see in this diagram. By that point when the city has become fully sort of greenified, the city becomes like a sponge. It's a remediating entity. Water that flows from the mountains through the city towards the river actually comes out cleaner than it came in. The final and most daunting challenge is eco-regulations, or rather the lack of it. Currently, regulations simply prevent most of our very basic ideas about sustainability, about eco-cities. We all agree it has to be, for instance, walkable, but the regulations force us to design something along this diagram. Coarse, spread apart, unwalkable. The real reason is that the regulations are not in touch with this organic reality of the city. I mentioned in the beginning, and I like to drive that point home. When I say organic, it means that cities are not planned, nor entirely organic, they're this weird hybrid. Bear with me as we run through 18 slides at high speed. Each slide is one year of rapid development of Chongqing and Chengdu, two big cities in the center of China. There we go. What you can see is that almost tentacle-like formations starts forming. The cities grow together naturally. A sort of urban gravity is taking hold. And yet every single element in this black ink blob is completely designed and planned. But if you zoom out, it becomes an organic reality, or what we call mud. Market-driven, unintentional development. Now mud defies planning, defies design. So when we started working our, our biggest, most ambitious city, Caofeijian, an eco-city of one million by 2040, we had to somehow incorporate this organic reality. We had to redesign planning itself. This is the current situation, rather bleak environment, where once it was a natural estuary. So could we, in 40 years, somehow let evolution take hold of this place again, making it green and urban at the same time? Can we make this hybrid work for us? Certainly not alone. If anything, the Panda principles that we're trying to avoid mean that we should work together and incorporate as much diversity, as mentioned in the introduction, as possible. So we invited nine other teams, very uh, formidable Dutch and Chinese architecture and planning firms. And we gave them a set of scenarios, including economic disaster. And then we asked them to design a perfect solution for the next three years, adding 100,000 people to this empty lot of 72 square kilometers. The first team only adds 100,000, and they can do it anywhere where normally, of course, the land is cut up in 10 pieces and given to these 10 teams separately. We ask one team to do it for three years. They have one month to do so. So the first team does these villages. The second team creates a new landscape. The third team, every time the file is passed on and teams build on top of each other, even demolishing some of the previously built solutions. So slowly but surely, you're actually recreating, simulating 
the natural growth of a city. You're actually in the computer um, recreating the conditions that we seem to have lost the way Paris, London, Mumbai has grown slowly over time, evolving cons with every generation, adapting. We do that now in the computer. This is the final stage. And in it, it contains a variety and a diversity and a complexity that you could never achieve if each of these teams would have developed their ideas independently and not on top, not in a relay, including a productive environment. Slowly but surely, these ideas merge, come together in one system. I'll show you a final little animation of how that works. home the point that there is no silver bullet to eco cities we should stimulate this urban experiment just as long as we listen to the intrinsic nature of the city thank you very much